They tell me that Fredericksburg in Texas will be probably the center of the total eclipse. We're going to have Monday, and already a lady went online from Fredericksburg and said that was poor planning to have it on Monday. It should be on Saturday. <laughs> That's just been in God's agenda probably for a few thousand years. And he made a serious mistake having it on Monday. She said it certainly should have been on Saturday to think about people. How the arrogant can we be as human beings, ladies and gentlemen, trying to tell God how to run the world? I asked you a question a few months back. Maybe you've had time to think on it a little bit. Are you idealistic? Are you a realist? Think about it again. Idealistic or realist, remember? Now, we voted, most of us would say, well, I'm idealistic. I'll tell you a secret. If you're idealistic, you build your life around ideas or precepts or dreams. If you're realistic, You build your life around fact and history. Without a doubt, we as Christians are realists. Jesus was not an idealistic person. He was a real person. Reading the Bible, the Word became flesh. The Word was the Logos, eternity. It was God himself. If the Word had remained the Word, but it didn't, it would have been the Word, it would be idealistic, but it became flesh, and that's realistic, because uh, incarnation is God becoming real in time and space right where we live. So make no mistake about it. We are realists. Now, a realist can have ideas and concepts and move on, but if they just stay ideas or dreams or concepts, they don't go anywhere. Whereas in life, we base our life on fact, on truth, not on myth or philosophy. Uh, philosophy, somebody said, is, well, like a man who was a philosopher, he was blind, and he went in a dark room looking for a black cat, which was not there. <laughs> a lot of people spend their whole life in that kind of philosophy. They never land. It's a difference between thinking like a Greek and thinking like a Roman. How did the Greeks think? All supposition. Let's argue. Let's debate. Let's try to determine what's going on. And they spent all their time in philosophy and supposition and being idealistic. The Socratic method, know what that is? You keep asking questions. Well, there is a rug. Well, what kind of rug is it? Oh, oh, is it, oh where did it come from? How is it woven? How did it get laid? And you could spend the rest of your life asking Socratic questions and never get anywhere with any firm definitions or move anything into action. The Jews were different. They debated things. They discussed things. But when they came to a conclusion, they asked the question, okay, I believe this. I understand this. This is true. Now, what do I do about it? Some people spend their whole life studying the Bible. Boy, they know the Bible. They know Scripture. They study, study, read, read, read. And they never take God's truth and put it in the middle of their life. See the difference? Idealistic. Realistic. Now, we're going back to the parables. 
We took a little Easter detour, and what a great detour it was because we reaffirmed again the simple fact that death is dead, and that's always good news, isn't it? We're back to the parables because the parables tell us what the kingdom of God is like. Remember the Bible, kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven are virtually always interchangeable. So don't be confused by that. So we receive the parables tell us what the kingdom of God is like. You don't know how life is going to be forever, how God operates in this world, how God will operate in eternity. We see the principle, and here Jesus is telling us what the kingdom of God is like. Over your Bibles, Matthew chapter number 13. We see in verse 10, and the disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? What is a parable? Simply stated, earthly statement with heavenly ramifications. That starts being an answer, but it is more than that. Remember, a parable is a truth that Jesus throws down for us. Jesus says, here it is. And then he goes on, explains about the parables. I love beginning here in verse 15. He says, but blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears they hear. For assuredly I say to you that many prophets and religious men and women desired to see what you see, did not see it, and hear what you hear, and did not hear it. He is saying a lot of people have wanted to heard this, the principle of the kingdom, but they didn't get to. A lot of people wanted to see those principles, they didn't see it. But he's saying, now I have come to give you what the kingdom of God is like now, and it will be like forever. And then he, we've already looked at the parable of the soils. That's the next parable. And then we go to the next parable, the parable of wheat and tares. Look at verse 24. And another verse, he, Jesus, put it to them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like principles of heaven, how things operate in heaven, what heaven is all about. And usually in most parables, they teach us several things, but always there's an overriding principle in every parable. The overriding principle here is a parable about judgment. We talk about justice. We talk about judgment. Here we have it. It's going to be taught here in this very basic parable. Another parable he put forth to them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field, but while men slept, the enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. What's he saying? He's saying, here's a man who owned a field. He went out and got good wheat seed and throw it in the, in the field when the ground was prepared. But while he went to sleep, the enemy came and sowed tares in the wheat field. A tear was a bastard wheat. It was a kind of seed that led to a growth of something that was a narcotic. It would make you sick if you ate it. It was a disastrous kind of narcotic that would disturb. But when you saw them growing together, here's a tear growing up. Here's wheat growing up. As they were growing, nobody could tell the difference. A tear, a weed, looked just like the wheat. The weed was deadening. The wheat was nourishing, but couldn't tell the difference. And so while th this man went to sleep, Somebody sowed this terrible, terrible disease seeds in the ground that would grow up and look just like the wheat until they topped out. Now, I wonder if this parable is teaching us that we ought to stay awake when we sowed good seed. I, it could be. I, I read this week about an incident in Indonesia. There were two pilots in a plane, both of them very experienced. One was young. 
He had twin children, just newly born. The older man was the head pilot, and they got up in the air about 36,000 feet. And while there, the young man said, you know, I've got newborn twins. I haven't slept in two days. He said, would it be all right? You fly the plane. I'll go to sleep over in the co-pilot seat. The older pilot said, certainly. I mean, I understand that. Anybody has children understand that? Anybody had twins? Anybody had twins? Lift your hand. You sure understand that. So he'd been up all night, night with his wife, with these twins. So he went to sleep. And the older pilot got him up to the altitude and put an automatic pilot, and he went to sleep. <laughs> and so the tower was watching it on the radar, and it was sort of slipping off course. And he tried to contact them, and both of them asleep, no response. 28 minutes he tried to contact them. The plane kept veering, veering, veering off the course until finally it awakened the older pilot, and he got up and got him back in course and went and landed, and they confessed that both of them went to sleep. Now, we understand why the young man went to sleep. Don't anybody have children? Anybody had twins or triplets? You absolutely understand it. But that doesn't mean what he did was all right because he had a high priority, didn't he? There were 150 people on that plane. His high priority was to be a pilot and to fly that plane safely as a co-pilot, right? So he, what he did, we understand, but that doesn't make it right. We make that mistake. We get our priority. Well, I did this because of this, but the highest priority we would have missed, that was the young man. The older man, man, he had, I don't know how many hours. He was a tremendous pilot. He went to sleep, but he put it on autopilot. I go to church Sunday after Sunday, and I look out among the congregation here, and I wonder how many on autopilot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've been to church. I've heard that song. I enjoy it. I'm faithful, but man, it really isn't turning my life on. I'm just sort of caught in neutral somewhere and just doing my duty. And I go along in order to get along. Autopilot. Sad. Sad. So here we have, they went to sleep. Didn't know the alien seed had been sown. I don't know if that's a bad thing. I don't know if we'd stay up all night, watch our crop as it grows. I don't think that's what's taught here. But it's interesting to observe. He said, but when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares appeared. And so the servants, the owner came and said, sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? You didn't, couldn't tell the tares were there, except the wheat would grow above the tares and the wheat would be heavy and would bow down. The tares would go straight up and remain straight then the tares would have a slightly different color, sort of slate gray, whereas the wheat would bow down. And the tares had a pride about them, which evidently I think the symbol of the wheat bowing down tells us how we are to grow and how we are to mature. That's an aside. And then how does it have tares? He said to them, an enemy has done this. The servant said to him, do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, no. Lest while you gather up the tares, you also root up the wheat with them. Let them both grow together until the harvest. At the same time of harvest, we'll say to the reapers first, gather together the tares and bind them in bundles and burn them, but gather the wheat and put it in the barn. What does he say? Now, he's talking about the world. He's not zeroed in on the church yet. He's saying in the world, sometimes we get to know somebody who looks like wheat. They talk the Christian language. We like them. We become friends. And my daughter meets their son. Boy, he comes from a God-fearing home. They get married only to discover after the marriage, one of them had the form of Christianity but no reality to it. No any exceptions like that? Does that ever happen? They looked all right. They sounded all right. They said some Christian things all right. 
They were christened when they were children. Certainly they're Christians. But we see what happens when we get in bound together. Wheat and tares get entwined together. What happens? And this can happen in business. You go in business with somebody or bring somebody in your business or you go in their business, say, boy, this, this is a Christian, a God-fearing individual. You get in there and the exact opposite is true. You're bound together. In friendships, two couples become friends and the men get along, the women don't, and how does it work out? And suddenly you're bound to someone, a wheat, somebody who wants to honor God and somebody who is not honoring to God. What do you do? You tear everything up. Man, I married this man. I thought he was a Christian. He's not even anything like a Christian. I'm ble- so this is, what, this is in the generality of the world now, not specifically the church. We'll see that in a minute. What do you do? And they said, well, just rip the tear away from the wheat. No, there's too much involved here. There's children involved here. There's business involved here. There's relationship involved here. He is saying there will come a time of harvest, when you'll know what's real and what's phony, what's of God and what's not of God. You sometimes just have to wait it out till harvest comes. And that's a long, long time in many situations involving a lot of pain because somehow we were not able to discern by the Holy Spirit what is real and what is phony. And then Jesus goes ahead And he tells this to the crowd. By the way, why did he talk in parables to the crowd? He used terms they can understand. They knew about fish. They knew about planting. They knew about harvesting. They knew about corn. They knew about wheat. They knew about grapes. They knew about leaven. They knew about relationships. And therefore, he used words in his parables that everybody could understand and he took those parables and applied them right in life and said this is how the kingdom operates this is how heaven operates this is how would have the earth to operate now and then he goes and says i'm going to give you an interpretation the crowd he was in a boat speaking a large crowd they dispersed he went to the shore, he went up to Capernaum, and he went up in his mother-in-law's house. Peter lived with his mother-in-law, ladies and gentlemen. I've been to the house, very house. Verse 35, then Jesus sent the multitude away, went to the house. His disciples came to him saying, explain to us the parable of the tares and the wheat. And Jesus answered and said to them, get this now, He who sows the good wheat is the son of man. Jesus was the sower of good seeds, good wheat. Got it? Need to do it to understand it. The field is the world. In other words, this is our father's world. God is the creator. He owns this world. Now, to be sure, the devil owns the flesh in the air, but this is God's world. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. In other words, you and I are seeds. If you know Jesus Christ, he's your Savior and Lord in your life. God has taken you and taken me. He's planted us in the world. We are to represent him in the world. Now, seed is a strong thing. A seed will bust through concrete. We've seen that. Seeds can get in your foundation, bring your house down. A seed is a living thing. By the way, remember this, regardless of what you heard some pseudo-philosopher say when you were in school, nobody then and now, nobody in the world, no scientist, no micro-scientist, no scholar, is even close to creating life. Did you know that? They're not even close. In fact, I don't know where you can find scientists today who are even trying to create life. They can put everything together it takes, but bam, life is not there. They can take everything that's in the seed and put it together and plant it. Life is not there. God is the given of life. And what he says here, you and I are seeds because he's given us life. Okay, everybody's alive here today. I hope maybe two or three. 
Uh, but he takes us and he puts us in the world as a seed that is alive. And what are we to do? Also, every time God puts a life in the world that's to bring forth fruit, the devil takes and puts one of his sons or daughters in the world right alongside that life. Every time, here we go, there's wheat, he puts in a tear, and the tear is in camouflage. The, the tear is not real. The, the tear is in disguise. So it's hard to tell. Parable, you know, here, here's, here's somebody who's real. Here's somebody who's false. Here's somebody, a life that's planted the world to bring fruit for God. And here is Satan who's planted a life that looks just like, but that life is a counterfeit. Counterfeit. Ever thought about a counterfeit? Uh, I read a spurious story about two men were counterfeiting in New York. And they had this machine. They were run off counterfeit bills. And somehow they mashed their own button. And they started to produce a whole stack of $15 bills. <laughs> and the guy said, what in the world are we going to do with these $15 bills? He said, man, we, we can't use them. Look at all that. His buddy said, well, we go down to Texas. He said, they're the dumbest people there in the world. So we can take these $15 wheels and use them in Texas. So they got in the car. They came to Texas. He came down the road. He saw a, a service station there, and there's one of our good old boys just sitting out there and working a little bit on a car, and they went up to him. He said, uh, he said, sir, can you change a $15 bill? He said, I will in just a minute. And the guy punched him. He said, I told you, they're dumb down here. He said, yes, I can certainly change that. Do you want uh, two threes and a nine or two sevens? <laughs> <laughs> counterfeit. Satan puts counterfeit lives here alongside every real wheat life here, and that's how they're mixed up in the world. But look what happens in the long run of life. The enemy has sowed them, the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, judgment. And the reapers are the angels, verse 40. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man gathered out of the kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness. In other words, in the time of judgment, there's not going to be any marginal people there. It's going to be clear. It's going to be plain. Well, I did pretty good. I tried hard. I was better than most. No, 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 no. It's going to be very clear. We get to heaven, there's not going to be a flaw up there, and we are all flawed now except by the blood and grace of Christ. But when we get up there, it will be clean. Your wheat, your tear, your God's man, your God's woman, or you belong to that which is godless. It'll be clear. That's what he's saying here. The Son of Man will send out his angels. They will gather out of his kingdom all things that are offend, no problem, and those who practice lawlessness, no problem, and cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. The others, the righteous, will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. What did he say here? What did he say? They'll be wailing and they, they'll be thrown in the fire. Well, that sounds kind of hard, doesn't it? You mean to tell me that hell is represented by fire? If fire is a metaphor, fire is telling us that's just a good way to realize something about hell. Let me tell you something. Jesus talked more about hell than any other person in all the Bible. Well, that's mighty strong. Let me tell you something. Fire and judgment through eternity is strong, but I'll tell you something that hell is, I think, is even stronger than that. Hell is where you can live your life forever and forever by yourself, alone throughout all eternity. You want to build a big house? Build you a big house. You want to have anything, you can have it in hell, but I'll tell you, you'll have it forever. Think about it alone. 
So fire is a good metaphor, and it may well be fire. So he's saying there'll be a separation between the tares and the wheat, and the tares, those who have been planted there by the evil one, they will be destroyed forever and forever, and the wheat will shine like the sun. Well, how do you know whether you're a wheat or a chair? Tear. That's what I ask myself. Man, I may be a tear. I may not have it all. We talk clearly many times how to know your wheat. Confess sin, repent of sin, receive Jesus Christ in your life. He will salvage you, restore you for the purpose for which you were made. And he also not only will salvage you, when that happens, he is to become the Lord of your life. The principal element of your life and my life should be the Lord Jesus Christ, right in the middle of it. So when judgment comes, he's not going to say, hey, you were anti-Christ. No, not many of us would say in my life I was anti-Christ. I was at least neutral, or I, I went to church some, but I wasn't anti-Christ. But the word anti-Christ in the Bible can mean not even against, but can mean instead of. Listen. In other words, I put my pride ahead of Christ. I put my position ahead of Christ. I put money ahead of Christ. I put my family ahead of Christ. No matter what that may be, I put something instead of Christ in my life, or you put something instead of Christ in your life, he's not the highest priority around upon which our life operates. I'm in Christ. He is in me. Christ is in you, and you're in him. That is the center of life. That's the mark of salvation. And when that is there, what happens? Remember, we're seeds, right? You and I are seed. Life, we're sown in the world to bear fruit. And then if there's fruit coming from your life and my life of the arena in which God has placed us, that's a part of the things that validate you and hopefully myself as wheat. We haven't put anything instead of Christ. He is superior over our life, and he is in us, and we are in him. That's a picture of judgment. Let me show you how this operates. Look at Matthew chapter 25. Great, great word here. It tells us how we know there's some validity in this. Look at verse 31. It's judgment. It says, when the Son of Man, that Jesus, comes in glory... Jesus came as a prophet when he's in this world, right? He was a prophet. Then he graduated. He's in heaven. Now he's a priest. He's the right hand of God. When you and I pray, he makes intercession with the Father. And then he will come and he'll be a king and a judge. This is that moment. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him. And he will separate them one from another as a, she as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. He will set the sheep, sheep on his right hand, the goats on his left. Then the king, that's Jesus, will say to those on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared to you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. Thirsty, you gave me drink. Stranger, took me in. Naked, you clothed me. You visited me when I was in prison. Then the righteous will say, Lord, we didn't see you hungry or naked or in prison. I don't know what you're talking about. And Jesus said, listen, if you've done it, one of the nobodies in the world, the least of these, you've done it to me. Reward time. Now, the other group, here are the goats. Then he arise and say to those in his left hand, depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for you before the devil and his angels. I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, you didn't take me in. I was naked, you didn't give me clothes. I was sick, in prison, you didn't visit me. And they said, Lord, we didn't remember being you being hungry or thirsty in prison or need clothes. And we don't remember that. And he said clearly to them, then he'll answer, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it, to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. 
and these will go away into everlasting punishment, but to the righteous, to everlasting. Can you tell the difference between a sheep and a goat? If I brought a goat up here, we say, that's a goat. You wouldn't look over here, well, that may be a goat. No, a sheep's a sheep, a goat's a goat. It will be that clear in judgment time. And the idea is, if this person had known that Jesus was hungry, he would have fed him. If Jesus didn't have any clothes, he would have given Jesus clothes. If Jesus, but see, it wasn't Jesus. It was other people. It was the nobodies. And this guy just turned his back on the nobodies. He would have helped Jesus, somebody important like that. Because he turned his back on the nobodies, it was the same as turning your back on Jesus himself. Judgment time. If we put anything in your life and my life, Instead of Christ, we're in trouble. So let's get our priorities right in this life. We can do good things and miss out on the highest priority on the best things. And therefore, we'll come before the Lord and he'll see, there's some sheep. Whoop, there's some goats. The goats would say, man, I deserve to be a sheep. No, 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 no. It will be clear and plain if we've received him in our life He's the center of your life and my life, and we're beginning to be seeds. God's seed. You're a seed. I'm a seed in the world. We're alive. We have calling. We have purpose. We have ministry. I don't know what it is. It doesn't have to be a big thing. It'll be a little thing. Next week, we're going to talk about little bitty things. Next week, little bitty things that are powerful. This is a preamble to that. So, the bottom line is, in that day of judgment, the Bible said we will shine, shine like the sun. The S-U-N and the S-O-N. And what a day of rejoicing that will be. Our Heavenly Father, we, we know there may be some modified tares here today, but Lord, let them know that in Christ they can become wheat. May this be the moment that some say, you know, I'm going to get all this tare stuff out of my life. I turn away from it. I want Jesus Christ to come and run my life now and forever so I can be a light in this dark world, a light in my family, a light where I work, a light in my neighborhood. Lord, may some come to that stance today and say, I surrender all to Jesus Christ. Use this invitation, we pray in his name.